Where do you want me to How are you? Good, good.
Please do come in, take a seat. We're just about to start.
I'd like to start by thanking everybody who's joined us here today. I know there are restrictions in the room and some people who wanted to be here are actually watching us online. I'd like to welcome viewers at Consortium News, Action for Assange, the Anons, um, Resist Group, and also um, a number of viewers from uh, the Workers' Party and other grassroots groups as well around the country and abroad who are uh, restreaming this event. I'd like to start also by thanking the people who helped start this series of events almost two years ago when we knew life in, in the real world. And those were the people at the Committee to Defend Julian Assange. Two of the JADC members gave 20 pounds each to help us start collecting the money to pay for this hall. And it was because of their support and solidarity and their work on the ground from outside the embassy to outside the courts, through to the streets of London, whether, you know, all over London, whether at Belmarsh, whether other grassroots groups at uh, Piccadilly Circus and elsewhere. Uh, very grateful to all of them for the work they have done, which has helped despite a pandemic, keep what is the world's most important political prisoner in the public eye, even though serious efforts are being made to prevent us from knowing what's really going on. The case of Julian Assange is particularly important to all of us, but for those of you who um, have not been to a Free the Truth event before, this is a grassroots or uh, gathering supported by the Committee to Defend Julian Assange. Um, it's organized by Professor Ian Munro uh, at Newcastle University and me. I'm, my name is Deepa Driver. I'm at the University of Reading. We are doing so in our private capacities as uh, activists who are deeply concerned about both whistleblowing and press freedom. We're also concerned about human rights and I'm really delighted that so many people have begun to wake up to the breach, the serious breaches of human rights that we've seen in the case of Julian Assange. These breaches range from absolutely bizarre things, such as the prosecuting country considering whether to murder the defendant in this case, that is the US hatching plans, the CIA hatching plans to murder Julian. Um, serious breaches of what we call attorney-client privilege and also medical confidentiality, sustained, intentional, and carried out over several years with the complicity of different states, where Julian was surveilled in the embassy, smeared, um, his case was kept in limbo intentionally, as we know from freedom of information requests gathered by the wonderful Italian journalist Stefania Maurizzi, we know that Keir Starmer's CPS, closer to home, was involved in ensuring that justice was not served. They kept the case in limbo so that no exculpatory evidence, that is evidence which would clear Julian's name, could be seen. They said, don't you dare get cold feet when the other side wanted to drop the case. And they continued to say that Julian did all kinds of awful things. This continued with his torture at the embassy, at the Ecuadorian embassy, where he had sought asylum. And as you know, he served a prison sentence for seeking asylum, uh, also rebranded as bail jumping. Um, and during that sentence, in the <laughs> sentence, so to speak, in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, Julian was mislabeled as um, hurting his cat, smearing fishies on the wall, all these kinds of smears where he didn't have a voice to be able to say what was really going on and nobody was willing to listen. And it was these grassroots activists who are in the room today who have organized and supported this event who saw through some of the smears and the lies that the intellectuals did not see through. So it is their courage and their solidarity that is really important in continuing to press this case. Right now in the courts, we are going through a very bizarre process. Um, a journalist who is not an American journalist, who is an Australian journalist, 
who conducted journalism in the UK and Europe, who has, whose WikiLeaks has 100% accuracy track record, is potentially going to be extradited to the United States to serve a 175-year prison sentence, which is essentially entombing him within a concrete bunker so that he cannot be heard from again. And we are here to resist. We are here to, to say this will not do and this, we will not stand for this. On the panel today, we have some wonderful people, uh, each of whom is an expert in their own field. And I'll just introduce them from left to right. Um, at the start, we have Andrew Feinstein, who is... Um, <clears throat> globally known for his work on the arms trade. He heads an organization called Shadow World um, Investigations. And um, Andrew's done so much to reveal what's going on behind the scenes and done it so courageously in so many ways. Andrew also served on, um, in the ANC government in, within Nelson Mandela's cabinet, so he knows what it's like to resist when the state is oppressing you and what it's like to stand with the side that is honest and true. Next, we have someone who has played a very, very important role in bringing Julian's voice, in bringing the case for Julian, rather, to Parliament. And Chris Williamson, whom many of you know from previous events. <laughs> and who is very well loved here. Um, was responsible for bringing the first motion in relation to Julian in Parliament. He has continued to campaign for Julian uh, in various places, small events, large events. He's put his name to it, and he's always made a place for Julian's, for the case for Julian to be heard. Next, we have a, a, a relatively new voice to the scene, a wonderful Icelandic journalist by the name of Bjartmar Alexanderson. Bjartmar... <laughs> As you may all know, Bjartmar um, wrote that fantastic piece um, and did the extensive legwork that went behind it in relation to Sigi Ingi, Ingi Thordarsson, who is the Icelandic um, witness in Julian's case that the FBI have, uh, uh, I, I mean, the easiest way to put it is bribed into misrepresenting what Julian did. And I'm hoping that Bjartmal will tell us a little bit more about his investigation and what happened. To my left, I have someone whom I greatly respect, Dr. Derek Summerfield. Derek has, is a... <laughs> is a psychiatrist within Doctors for Assange. He has spoken out on a, num on a number of occasions about the psychological torture of Julian. Derek is also known for his, for his role as the chief psychiatrist at what is now Freedom From Torture. So um, it used to be called the Medical Foundation for Torture Victims, right? Thank you very much for joining us um, to all the panel. And we have an empty seat here, and he will be joining us shortly. It's for Lauri Love, and we will give him a round of applause when he arrives. <laughs> Lowry needs little introduction. He is the hacktivist um, and information scientist who used his, um, his skills to, uh, to speak up for those who are oppressed, those who are poor, and was very instrumental within the Occupy campaign. I'd also like to introduce a couple of people who are in the audience whose work um, has been crucial to having these events. I'm sorry for the long introductions, but one of them is sitting right at the front. It's Somerset Bean, um, who's... <laughs> if you see any of the images around London on the billboards, online, <laughs> on Twitter, anywhere, it's almost always Bean's images. So he is the graphic artist, uh, creative uh, expert, 
who, who's um, fueled the campaign with his images and uh, with his wonderful infographics. Um, thank you for joining us. And also, um, Carlos is uh, streaming the, the event for us. Thank you for joining us, Carlos. I, I won't embarrass you. So as you can see, Carlos is um, capturing images. So please make yourself scarce upstairs if you don't want to be caught on the screen. But um, just, just to warn you in advance. I'd now like to welcome Emmy Buckland, whom all of you know, everybody knows Emmy, uh, <laughs> to tell us a little bit about what the campaign to defend Julian Assange does. Thank you very much, Deepa. It's an honor to um, welcome everyone here. We are back after a long period of absence uh, when the country has been facing a pandemic. We're extremely grateful to the people who've turned up. Uh, as I said to Deepa, we have to start. We have to start meeting again in a safe manner. Uh, Julian Assange cannot wait. He needs us and he needs every single one of us. We are grassroots solidarity group. We are comprised by ordinary people who come together to do their bit in creating something extraordinary. A movement across country, across political spectrum, in defense of uh, a man who, through his work, Work with WikiLeaks has enlightened the world. This man has been attacked from the very beginning due to his publication. He has inspired every single one of us. We continue the work of solidarity by coming together as members of the public and finding out what we can do. We have here very eminent politicians, academics, medical experts, professionals, but we also have the public, us. And the more inspiration we get from this movement, the more we can tap into our own creativity and see how far it takes us in collaborating together to bring together a change in society where WikiLeaks journalism is applauded throughout society, not just by the public. Uh, WikiLeaks work has touched our hearts and we are highly motivated from that perspective. I would like to invite all of you to find what you can do as members of the public. Turn around to the people next to you, find ways of collaborating, because only by working in collaboration with each other, we are able to multiply the effect and have impact. I mean, today's event would not have been possible for the work and collaboration of a small number of people who have brought this about. Uh, I, you are all part of it, and we're very grateful for your donations. Um, there will be some buckets later which you can um, donate to uh, towards the costs of the hire of the hall. So I'm passing back the microphone to our lovely deeper driver, and we're really looking forward to hearing more and freeing some more of the truth about what has occurred. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to invite Bjart Maar, who's put out the, the latest scoop um, in relation to the Assange case, and to tell us a little bit about the key witness in the FBI's prosecution against Assange, why he's important, who he is, and what Bjart Maar found out about his testimony and about him. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, my name is, um, I always say to these people, my name is Bjartmar Alexandersson, or full name Bjartmar Otter Their Alexandersson. Yeah, it's a long Icelandic Viking name. Uh, talk to my parents about that. Um, um, this case uh, is one of the strangest ones I've ever worked on, regarding a, a person involved in a case. Um, and um, even for Icelandic standards, and trust me, we have we words. Um, it's... Um, the main witness in the FBI case against Julian Assange 
uh, is named Seurður Thordason. And uh, before he changed his name, as many criminals do in Iceland, his name was Seurður Ingi Thordason. And um, he is one of the most famous Khan artists in Iceland. Everybody knows this guy. And um, he is pronounced, uh, actually, his nickname is called Siki the Hacker. You might have seen, seen this in international news. But according to my research, he has no hacking ability whatsoever. Um, he actually needed the assistance of the FBI to get a video downloaded from a mobile phone. We have that email. So he is... Um, a con artist that is on a high level only using this nickname to scare people. And there are certain people he likes to scare. And that are his victims which he sexually abused. Almost 15 of them, minus. Um, which uh, only nine were went to court, uh, which he was convicted for. Um, there were 15 boys under age. But, and one of these individuals actually committed suicide for, after his case did not go to court. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really good witness, morality-wise, to take this guy. So he's been stealing out of, um, from individuals and companies in Iceland for years. Even he stole 50,000 United States dollars from WikiLeaks when he was actually a volunteer in a small role inside there. Um, and he actually used his role um, um, to, uh, I would say, no, I'm, I'm translating here in my head here. Um, he actually used his role to, to uh, push his ego up, even to, to get his victims to, um, to meet him. Um, and the thing is here, he's been convicted of, of everything of this. Um, and now um, he's actually in Icelandic prison. Um, he was four weeks ago, he was put in uh, ma of the maximum security prison in Iceland. Um, the court of the police actually asked for a, a very certain detailed law that's not often used, which is used for serial offenders. So, and the judge accepted, and just today it was, um, it's now extra four weeks, which the judge now decided to, to lengthen this. Um, a prison sentence that he has. So the police and the special prosecutor in Iceland are actually investigating him now for a fraud case that is almost one million pounds in Iceland. Um, and uh, this is, he's doing all, he's on a crime spree while he actually has a uh, um, FBI, in, uh, um, sorry, immunity agreement with the FBI, which he was given in back in 2019. So this is the backstory basically of the main witness of the FBI. And I did a nine hour extensive interview, interview with him and um, in over, over a few days. And what he actually admitted to me is that the case against, or uh, as, uh, a lot of uh, the, the indictment cases inside the indictment, sorry, um, are basically a lie. Um, there are several, um, um, points in the indictment that are basically not truthful. Um, for example, um, in the indictment, it's asked that it said that um, Mr. Thorson asked was asked by Julian Assange to hack the Icelandic Parliament and the mobile phone or, or the conversa phone conversations. Well, this is a lie, and we actually could prove that, and we put that in print. Um, and there are many other uh, um, um, occasions in the indictment which cannot be proven and also is basically a lie. And why this is important? Well, legally, it's kind of bad to put a lie in, in an indictment and go to court with it in any case. So uh, being the prosecutor in this case, I wouldn't want to be him. Um, and the, this, what you see, is just a small speck of everything has been happening to Julian. It's it's plenty of it. And, um, but Mr. Thorson plays a, a huge role in the case against him because he is the main witness of transforming Julian from a journalist to a hacker. And that's why his testimony is so important. Of all the people who are working as volunteers or members of staff for WikiLeaks, not a single person to come forward with the same testimony as Sigurd Thorson. So it makes you wonder that only the only individual who 
to actually the FBI could put in, 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 in writing with his testimony that Julian Assange was a hacker and not a journalist. Well, it makes you wonder how strong the case is if you have to find a con artist and a pedophile to do so. So um, um, it's... And, and everybody know this guy back in Iceland. Nobody knows them internationally on, until now, most of the time. But it's, it's he, and he's still conning, you know, not anymore, at least in prison, but he's, he was conning all the time when this case was going on. Um, the most Most important thing also for, uh, for me as an Iceland is how the US government and the FBI lied on not only to their citizens but to the citizens of Iceland and they abused our laws in Iceland to, ape, to, to go on with this investigation inside Iceland during the time. So that's also a story that I've been writing on how they uh, abused their power in Iceland um, to basically do illegal things. Um, but we, we, we stood back, our uh, interior minister actually threw the FBI out of the country back in 2013. So we in Iceland, we kind of, we don't like these basically assholes in this matter, if I can say that. Um, but it's, it's a really important um, thing inside your diamond. It is a legal thing, yes. It can be really complicated for, for normal people to understand the legality of this um, and testimony. But as I always say, it's basically a testimony of a liar, a pedophile, and a, and a, and a, and a criminal. So um, hopefully now, through the appeal case, the UK courts will see that this case is built on lies, and there was never a case in the beginning to make Julian anything than a journalist. Um, if he's a hacker, then I'm a hacker because I have published documents um, and so to try to create some kind of a weird monster out of this guy, you know, it's, he's just doing his job as I'm doing mine. And um, I think, you know, personally, I think they just saw losers. That's the thing. They had secrets, they couldn't hide it and they came, became public and they were embarrassed. And this is most of the news that I write, that I embarrass people that are actually trying to hide something and the truth comes up. So I, hopefully we will see something happen in the next two days. The trial starts tomorrow and um, for two days. And let's hope that in a few weeks, uh, four to eight weeks, I think, we will have a verdict that shows that this case was complete bullshit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for a very important, I would say, testimony. Because I think it's important for us to hear this from the people who are doing the work to uncover what's really going on. So thank you very much, Batman. And thank you for coming all the way from Iceland to be, to be here for Julian. Bjartmar talked about how um, Bjartmar talked about how it, the people who should be ashamed and embarrassed are within the U.S. state, within their allies who covered up war crimes, rape, murder, torture in other parts of the world, who, while taking the knee and pretending Black Lives Matter, destroyed entire countries and civilizations. But instead, the person who has been humiliated, who has been mistreated, who has lost a decade, more than a decade of his life, a, a very productive life where, where, you know, who brought the person who brought together technology and journalism to create a new form of journalism, which is what Julian did. Um, I think there is a bit of background noise outside. Excuse us a second. Thank you. 
Um, I'd now like to invite Dr. Derek Summerfield, who's an expert um, on torture, to tell us a little bit about uh, what torture is, how Julian has been tortured. Is, this, is it just the use of a very exaggerated term uh, when we talk about Julian being tortured? What does it mean and what effects will he be suffering at the moment? Um, or what effects can one expect him to be suffering at the moment? Thanks, Deepa. Just to set the scene, for, if, if I may, which is that we're talking about a particular Western citizen who has been a revealer of truths about the lies to us, about the war on terror, about the war crimes, and spying on us. And this takes place in the context of the erosion every day of civil liberties in this country, something that has started from the Blair era. Gareth Pierce, the uh, human rights lawyer in, in London, says that the UK has a human rights emergency running just under the surface. And Assange, I think, is part of that. The British government spies on all our emails and texts and, and all of that um, prevent enjoining doctors, nurses, uh, lecturers, and teachers to spy on their students and patients, all of these things. And, the kind of, um, and yet we have to have a political show trial, and indeed a political show pre-trial for someone who has been more or less in, in solitary confinement for 10 years in different situations, and I'll come back to that. The situation he's been in since he's been in Belmarsh reminds me of um, critique of what are called close supervision units, which uh, exist today at the heart of the British political system for the so-called hard, hard liners, mostly Muslim men, um, very much in isolated, uh, coercive psychiatry. And a few years ago, Sir David Ramsbottom, who's the chief uh, inspector of prisons, described it as, quote, total isolation in punishment conditions. I think that's probably fair for what um, Assange has been through. Just as a two minutes of history, uh, another player in all of this has been the current UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Neil Mel Meltzer. <laughs> I presume he's not here. No? But I, in, in, I've had a lot of involvement over many years with Palestinian human rights, and I've met a lot of UN uh, special rapporteurs, and they're quite cautious about what they prepare to put their name to. And Meltzer's been quite different from the start. When he met Assange in prison two years ago, he said this is someone akin to someone who's been psychologically tortured um, and talked about the destruction of the individual, quote, die, downward spiral, something deliberate and cumulative. Meltzer said that in 20 years, He'd never seen a, a, a group of democratic states so ganging up on a particular individual. And he requested that the UN retract authorization for extradition and brought in the UN working group on arbitrary detention. As you know, the British government has, been, uh, has abandoned him, as has the Australian government, country of his birth, of his citizenship, and have responded to nothing we've done or to multiple calls by well-heeled signatories around the world and Noam Chomsky and that sort of thing. So where are we with him? Total isolation and punishment conditions. I might note the solitary confinement is associated with a longer term higher death rate for various reasons. And what he's been going through, obviously, as we could all imagine, is persistent attacks on our, all of our social needs for um, privacy, dignity, social connection, personal identity issues. You know, the constant shaming vilification, and he couldn't speak it back, hopelessness, helplessness, fear, anxiety, all the things we can imagine, which are indefinite and which must be no more assuaged now than they were a few years ago on the eve of, the tr of this, this hearing tomorrow, as well as sort of sensory deprivation, uh, surveillance, ac decreased access to lawyers, a, a scandal in itself, and spying on the lawyers. There's a sense in which this is a kind of, it's been a kind of long drawn out, hanged drawn, drawn and quartering, as they had in the Middle Ages where uh, the execution of someone was, you know, which was preceded by various sort of grotesque, um, grotesque punishments and mutilations, which drew it out into this long process. So that's sort of where we are. As Tarek Ali said the other day, everyone knows the stuff is true. I mean, no one's saying it's not true. You know? And millions have died. Millions. Huh? Non-Westerners have died. 
It's funny to think about that. What, what Assange reminds us of is that these millions of people have been mere feathers in the weight that they bear on the scales by which the US and the UK and others measure their interests in the Middle East. Yeah. If we lose this, I don't know. Um, and so he stands uh, as, a, as a sort of unique truth teller, really. I mean, there have been a number of truth tellers around. Noam Chomsky at a different level is a truth teller. These sort of people. But we see what happens to, to truth tellers in the, in the current age of so called Western liberal democracy. Thank you, Derek. I'd like to now invite Chris Williamson to say a few words about. Um, Yes, of course. No, thanks, thanks very much indeed, uh, Deeper. And uh, first, let me say it's great to be sharing a platform with a proper journalist, because we've been definitely let down in this country by journalists. And uh, so, let me start really by paying tribute to you, Deeper, for your tireless work in Julian's behalf, and of course, the uh, the Julian Assange Defence Committee too, who've been relentless in fighting Julian's corner from the very start. People like Emmy Butlin, who we've heard from already, Clara Campos, and of course, Fidel Neves, the former consul at the Ecuadorian embassy. They've demonstrated what solidarity really means. Look, I'm sure we'd all agree here that Julian Assange is an inspiration to the world and a role model for others to follow. But let's be clear, he's been betrayed by this country. Betrayed by the politicians on both sides of the House of Commons chamber. Betrayed by the journalists who work for the corporate media. And betrayed by a judicial system that serves the interests of war criminals and corporate crooks instead of the interests of justice. Julian's treatment by the British establishment is nothing short of an international outrage. It's brought shame on our country. And of course, it's being, and of course it's being done, let's remember, it's being done in our name because we're supposed to live in a democracy, aren't we? So it shames all of us too. But I object and I reject the system that's incarcerated a journalist for telling the truth, for exposing, for exposing sickening war crimes and corporate corruption. How dare Dominic Raab accuse China of gross and egregious human rights abuses when that's precisely what his government's doing to Julian Assange? Yeah, yeah. The, the hypocrisy is absolutely breathtaking. And I'm sick to death of listening to ministers castigating countries like Russia, China and Iran when they're either in, unwilling or incapable of getting their own house in order here in Britain. And what about the leader of the official opposition? <laughs> Sir Keir Starmer. As a knight of the realm, he's a pillar of the establishment. And when he was the director of public prosecutions, he did his level best to get Julian extradited to Sweden on trumped up charges. And I've got to say, I'm very sad that even Jeremy Corbyn said he didn't object to the attempted extradition to Sweden. And the right-wing Labour MP, Stella Creasy, positively reveled in the feeding frenzy. She even persuaded more than 70 parliamentarians to sign a letter to the Home Secretary in April 2019. 56 of these characters were Labour MPs and peers, and nine others had recently resigned the Labour whip to join the ill-fated Change UK, otherwise known as the Funny Tinge Party. Creasy was insisting on Julian's extradition to Sweden and her parliamentary missive to Sajid Javid urged him to, and I quote, do everything you can to champion action that will ensure that Julian Assange can be extradited to Sweden. But look, all of these politicians, all of these parliamentarians knew that the extradition to Sweden was just a pretext. They knew the idea was to get Julian extradited to Sweden so that he could then be extradited to the US. Why was I the only MP pushing Julian's case? Where were the other MPs? Where were the MPs? 
Where were the MPs who claimed to champion free speech? Where were the MPs who bang on about a free press? And where were the socialist MPs who protest about corporate corruption and illegal wars? The unacceptable truth is they were all keeping their heads down. And I've got to say, the silence was deafening. Now, I'm obviously pleased that some MPs are at last speaking out. I just wish that senior figures like Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell and Richard Bergen had used their positions when they were shadow ministers to plead Julian's case. The number of MPs who are speaking out is still woefully inadequate. So Julian has clearly been betrayed by Britain's political class. But what about his fellow journalists? With a few notable exceptions, their role has been utterly contemptible. One of those notable ex exceptions is John McAvoy. He's an investigative journalist who writes for publications such as Declassified UK and The Canary. He recently highlighted the deathly silence of journalists who previously mocked Julian, but then said nothing about the shocking revelations, and they really were shocking revelations, that the CIA were plotting to kidnap and assassinate him. Apparently, Mike Pompier wanted revenge after WikiLeaks published the Vault 7 files in 2017. This, as I'm sure you're aware, was the largest leak in CIA history, and it revealed how UK agencies had held workshops with the CIA to find ways to hack into the household devices of every citizen in the United Kingdom. Why didn't the Fourth Estate call out this clear abuse of power? And why hasn't there been wall-to-wall -wall media coverage of the CIA's covert plans to murder an award-winning journalist on British soil? It's an absolute disgrace and an outrage. I mean, you know, it's astonishing, isn't it, that it's hardly been mentioned by the corporate media. And when Jen McEvoy was uh, looking into the coverage of Julian Assange earlier this month, he discovered that the BBC, which has the world, one of the world's most read news outlets, had only mentioned it once. And that was on the Somali language section of the BBC website. Of course, the story did appear a couple of times in The Guardian after it first broke. Although, to put that into perspective, the week after Alexei Navalny was reportedly poisoned by the Russian government, The Guardian published 16 separate stories on the issue, including video reports and opinion pieces. But stories that embarrass Western intelligence service, services are invariably played down or ignored altogether by the corporate media. <laughs> thankfully, though, thankfully, though, independent outlets like Declassified UK, The Canary and The Grey Zone still have some journalistic integrity. The independent media are the only ones who are still prepared to pick up the cudgels on our behalf. And it was the grey zone that first re uh, provided the evidence of a CIA-linked proposal to kidnap and poison Julian in May 2020. And of course, it was a similar tale that we've just heard when, uh, in June this year, a key prosecution witness admitted that his entire testimony against Julian was false. Now, that was an explosive revelation. Yeah, the corporate media has hardly given it any coverage at all. Anyone who doubted the corporate media's role as a mouthpiece for the establishment must have surely been disabused of those doubts by the way in which Julian's case has been reported. These corporate media hacks have brought their profession into total disrepute. They prove themselves to be nothing more than stenographers for the security services. Fearless journalists, they ain't. And here's just a few examples of the ridiculing reportage to which John McAvoy was referring. Now, it's almost four years since The Guardian's James Ball, uh, James Ball claimed, and I'm quoting him now, the only barrier to Julian Assange leaving Ecuador's embassy is pride, apparently. He also said that Julian was unlikely to face prosecution in the United States. And two months later, he said, Julian was being treated like a grounded teen. He should hold his hands up and leave the embassy. Another corporate media hack 
was also dismissive about Julian's plight. In a piece by uh, Mar Mar Marina Hyde, she wrote in The Guardian in 2017 that uh, the moral of the Assange story was wait long enough and bad stuff goes away. Hyde concluded her sneering story with a sarcastic comment that Captain WikiLeaks will get out of pretend jail eventually. And of course, the insults and ridiculing have been relentless. When Julian sought political asylum in 2012, Suzanne Moore said this, I bet Assange is stuffing himself full of flattened guinea pigs. He really is the most massive turd. And let me quote what she said in an article for the New Statesman after Julian was arrested in 2019. She referred to him as a demented looking gnome being pulled out of the Ecuadorian embassy by the secret police of the deep state or the Met as normal people call them. Incredibly, this horrendous hack won the Orwell Prize for journalism the same year. I mean, it's hard to believe, isn't it? For what was described as her stubborn and brave commentary. But unlike Julian's work, there's nothing remotely brave about this cynical character's scribblings. Never mind the Orwell Prize for Journalism, she's more like a functionary from the Ministry of Truth. I just wonder what George Orwell would make of her if he was alive today. Remember, he said that speaking the truth in times of universal deceit is a revolutionary act. And Suzanne Moore is complicit in that universal deceit. As is Nick Cohen, who in 2012 described Julian supporters as the definition of paranoia. And he scoffed at the idea that the US could prosecute Julian and pejoratively called him the incontinent leaker. Cohen confidently proclaimed, the First Amendment to the US Constitution is the finest defense of freedom of speech yet written. He also insisted that the American Civil Liberties Union thinks it would be unconstitutional for a judge to punish Assange. And he boldly declared that Britain has a notoriously lax extradition treaty with the United States. Every single one of Cohen's assertions was wrong. These corporate media hacks are an absolute disgrace. And their employers are even worse. Not one of them published the observations by Nils Melzer on Julian's case. As we've heard, he's the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. In June 2019, he wrote a piece for the Medium blog site. He admitted that he was skeptical when Julian first appealed to his office for protection. And let me quote a few passages from the article that he wrote. He said, like most of the public, I'd been subconsciously poisoned by the relentless smear campaign which had been disseminated over the years. So it took a second knock on my door to get my reluctant attention. But once I looked into the facts of this case, what I found filled me with repulsion and disbelief. In the end, it finally dawned on me that I'd been blinded by propaganda and that Assange had been systematically slandered to divert attention from the crimes he exposed. Once he'd, once he'd been dehumanized through isolation, ridicule and shame, just like the witches we used to burn at the stake, it was easy to deprive him of his most fundamental rights without provoking public outrage worldwide. Of course, these observations were absolutely apposite. And it's the corporate media who've outrageously peddled the smears to dehumanize Julian. So that's the political class and the corporate media. What about the judicial system? Well, so far, it's proved itself to be nothing short of a sick joke. Why on earth? Why on earth is Julian, why on earth is Julian even having to fight an extradition application at all, let alone find himself incarcerated in a high security prison for over two years? Article 4 of the extradition treaty between the UK and the USA is unambiguous. It clearly states that extradition shall not be granted if the offence for which extradition is requested is a political offence. What could be more political than exposing war crimes, I ask you? <laughs> now, I I've heard it claimed, I've heard it claimed that Parliament removed the bar on political offences, though, because the Extradition Act didn't specifically refer to them when the legislation was passed in 2003. But that doesn't stand any scrutiny at all. When the Extradition Bill was being debated in the House of Commons in December 2002, uh, the issue of political offences 
was actually raised by MPs. And the government's response was absolutely unequivocal. Responding to the debate on the extradition bill on the 9th of December that year, Bob Ainsworth explicitly stated that the bill will ensure that no one can be extradited where the request is politically motivated. So I ask you, what the hell is going on? It's as plain as a pike staff, as far as I'm concerned, that the system that Julian's fighting is completely rotten to the core. As Edward Snowden is reputed to have said, when exposing a crime is treated as committing a crime, you're being ruled by criminals, which pretty much, which pretty much sums up Britain today. Look, Julian's been betrayed by the politicians. He's been abandoned by the corporate media. And so far, he's been unjustly treated by the judiciary. But we, the people, are Julian's last line of defense. And failure is not an option. With the world standing on the brink of climate catastrophe and the AUKUS deal raising tensions with China, the need for fearless journalism has never been more important. So let's make one hell of a stink tomorrow to show the court that the British people say, free Julian Assange now! for that very inspiring uh, speech, Chris. And if there's a revolution, Chris is always at the head. <laughs> we are glad to stand with you. Um, our next speaker is someone who has endured a huge amount of stress, difficulty, hardship, as a result of being somebody who's always championed the oppressed. He has used his incredible um, information technology skills, his, um, his intelligence, and importantly, his character to stand up for what is right. And I'm, I'm really honored to welcome to our panel, Lauri Love. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, so firstly, apologies for being somewhat delayed. Um, traffic and other things conspired to uh, make me later than I planned to be. I'm thankful to be invited and honoured to be sitting amongst um, such distinguished um, individuals and, uh, may I say, comrades. And um, to paraphrase uh, Oscar Wilde, aka Hacker, um, I, I am a hacker. I do not deny it. I claim it with pride. Um, as I define, a hacker to be someone who um, sees technology not just as a product that is given to them um, in, a, in a way that it was designed by another uh, to serve some other purpose, but um, as an open possibility to be taken apart, put back together <clears throat> new and interesting ways to change the world, uh, hopefully for good. And um, it was in that spirit um, of the hacker as one who can forge a path uh, in the frontiers of a world that's ever changing because of technology um, that I joined the internet at a tender early age in the, uh, the 90s. Um, and was inspired by uh, the likes of uh, Julian Assange, um, by the likes of John Perry Barlow, who wrote the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, um, which is too long, so I'd love to read it in full, <laughs> but we don't have time. But um, the basic thesis was that um, there is a new, a new world, a new digital world, where 
everyone is brought together. Everyone has in potential an equal footing and equal ability to associate, to exercise freedom of speech, to enrich themselves through access of information and to um, dream and by dreaming bring about a different world. And that this, uh, this, this new space, this new cyberspace must be free from the, the anchors that have weighed down societies, um, the agenda, the, the limitations of uh, region, factionalism, divisions of eth ethnicity, language, religion, and mundane politics, and greed. And um, so these people, these pioneers, um, some called cypherpunks, called cypherpunks because they used um, the, the science of cryptology, cryptography, uh, ciphers and beyond ciphers, the ability to design systems uh, so that there isn't a need to trust, there isn't a need to um, depend on powers and authorities being benevolent and being in our best interest, that we can uh, take the power into our own hands to communicate one with another securely, um, to, to create our own infrastructure for the um, collection and dissemination of information. Um, and so Julian Assange inspired me um, through his, his early work in cryptography, but obviously through uh, WikiLeaks when, as we all know, um, they broke through um, the mold, the restrictions of um, the press that has unfortunately become suborned um, and secondary and subverted and corrupted by power and influence, um, you know, Faustian pact for access or to have a comfortable life or because of the, the group thing that comes out of them being very specialized class, shall we say, um, that, that is exclusive of um, many different people. Um, but we've, you've heard of that from much better people than me. Um, I, I will salute um, my comrade Chris Williamson, um, who, I, who I met at the Rebel Tent um, at the, um, the Beautiful Days Festival um, before he had been drummed out of the, the Labour Party um, for standing up for the rights of the Palestinian people. Um, and so he knows firsthand what it's like for media to be complicit in a, a campaign of uh, bad faith, um, a, 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 an innuendo and a taboo. Um, this is what we see against Julian Assange. My personal story in this connection um, began with the tragic event that we are trying to prevent here, which is the avoidable loss of life of a courageous truth teller by the name of Aaron Swartz, who um, was a young, Internet Wunderkind in the United States who uh, helped design some of the protocols that we still use on the web today, uh, RSS, um, uh, but then went into activism, um, not maybe out of predilection or because he wanted to be involved in politics, but out of a sense of necessity because um, he wanted to, again, bring about this better world through the internet. And uh, he, he helped stand up against some some bad legislation that the, the United States Congress was bringing in to curtail internet freedoms and to empower uh, the copyright cartel and the uh, security industries to uh, undermine uh, users' rights. And because he was so successful, because he had been associated with creating technologies to uh, enable whistleblowing, to enable the conveying of information securely to outlets such as WikiLeaks, um, technology we now call SecureDrop that is used all over the world. Um, they had a pretext to arrest him for uh, downloading scientific journal articles from a library computer system at MIT. And um, he was hounded to death by an overzealous prosecutor um, and because he was in the, the bad books of people in power that wanted to make an example of someone so that others would not be so courageous um, because he had been an inspiration to others. So it was after Aaron Swartz's death um, that there was a campaign on the internet, uh, a hacktivist campaign, shall we say, under the, um, the banner and branding of uh, Anonymous, um, trying to make, shall we say, a forced point through the exercise of political speech, um, through uh, means and methods considered outside of the um, acceptable ones, but non-destructively, but certainly getting a message out there uh, on various government computer websites, uh, saying that something has to change. And just to summarize it, uh, the, the reason why Aaron was able to be um, forced into 
the tragic decision he made to end his own life was because the United States federal justice system, uh, I have to put the air quotes around justice in my head, um, operates under a coercive plea bargaining system um, where by 97% of federal criminal defendants do not even see their day in court, do not stand before a jury of their peers to be judged by their peers after an adversarial system of evidence and argument and contention and findings of fact. Instead, they take a plea bargain, they take an offer they can't refuse, to, to quote a film about gangsters, um, because this is a story about gangsters. Um, and the reason they take this offer they can't refuse is because the, the leeway of the federal criminal sentencing um, guidelines and the freedom of prosecutors to pile on charges so that uh, they can say, you cooperate with us, you sacrifice your rights to a free trial, you turn and you inform upon your comrades, become part of our system of oppression and we will give you five years or ten years and if you don't, you'll face 75 years as Aaron faced for accessing science, uh, 99 years as I faced for allegedly speaking up about this, and then um, over 100 years as Julian Assange faces for giving the world evidence of war crimes, of torture, and horrific things done in their name with their tax money ostensibly in the interests of safeguarding freedom and democracy. And so it was delightfully ironic, as we say in the habit of British understatement, when I found myself subject to that same, potentially subject to that same American injustice system when after they failed to bring charges against me in the United Kingdom because um, I didn't agree to subvert my own use of cryptography um, because I believe that people have a right, not only a right, but a responsibility to store data securely uh, against robbers, against abusive partners, and against an abusive state. Um, so having not helped a lovely national crime agency put me in prison here, um, I had the three remarkably similarly dressed people in uh, trainers and short back and sides turn up to my door and uh, say that they were taking me back to America. Uh, um, as they didn't seem to appreciate, this was the Metropolitan Police's extradition squad, uh, didn't seem to appreciate that I hadn't, hadn't been to America, um, and likely never will. Um, but regardless of the fact that I haven't been to America, um, and as such, under the common sense understanding of how criminal justice should work, could not have broken their laws, which, if they have validity anywhere, that validity must surely end at their borders and not extend across the world. Um, but somehow I was, regardless, taken to the police station, taken to Westminster Magistrates Court. Uh, my parents had to cough up a significant for them sum of money, uh, less significant than the amount that had to be coughed up for our friend Julian. But regardless, I had to go to prison for a short time until the, the bail was secured. And uh, I had the privilege of being able to prepare um, for the five year process as it ultimately took to, to fight this extradition uh, with some limited freedom, just having to travel to a police station quite often to sign bits of paper and um, you know, give up my passports. Uh, but at least I was able to uh, access uh, my lawyers, to, to access the press, to access the internet, although they did try to ban me from the internet, it didn't quite work. Um, and so, um, so I had to go through the process that Julian has gone through and is now, we hope, and confidently have faith, is coming to the right conclusion. Um, and so I'll just speak briefly um, as to why that process is harrowing in ways that hopefully are not too redundant with what our other comrades have said. So firstly, we might have this naive expectation from watching 
so much propaganda we see on the television of law and order programs and other attempts to uh, whitewash and uh, romanticize uh, how, how justice is uh, run by the state. That uh, when you go to a court, there will be some effort at objectivity and there will be some attempt to have fairness. That there will be a judge whose job is to ensure that there is no foul play, that there is no um, systematic attempts to, uh, to distort the truth, um, and that the process shall, shall be fair, that, you know, that, that justice should be blind, that all should be equal before the law. Um, unfortunately, this is not the case at the best of times, um, certainly not for people that uh, don't have the privilege that I have of being you know, white and sort of middle class, sounding and male. Um, but in, in the case of extradition against the United States, um, there is not even the pretense of a fair process because the, the treaty was renegotiated in the, the wake of the, the war on terror, the war on terror, or the war on terra, planet Earth that was uh, engaged upon by George W. Bush, Tony Blair, and the other lackeys in the coalition of the willing but had been the agenda of the, the people behind those convenient uh, representatives for some time and continues to be their agenda. Um, and it was renegotiated such that there is no requirement for the United States to prove even the lowest definition of there being an answerable case, which is the legal term of a prima facie case. So on the face of it, that there is evidence to believe that this person has committed a crime in this jurisdiction that should be answerable in this jurisdiction and therefore um, the court should have faith that they will receive a fair trial um, on the other side of that process. Um, because this, this, this requirement was taken away, um, it meant that I, I had to sit in that goldfish bowl at Westminster Magistrate Court, as, as Julian has had to sit and observe a long sequence of lies and distortions and dissimulations be trotted out and be unable to stand up in frustration as I saw Julian do, felt very much how I'd felt in that situation, the need to say, hold on, hold on a minute, it's not even, not even false, it doesn't even make sense what you're saying here, it's not even conceptually um, cogent, etc. Um, instead, you have to let the process unfold and you have to let the arguments be argued that are able to be argued. And because the court will not entertain such obvious arguments already mentioned, as there, uh, the matter of jurisdiction, the, the jurisdiction in, in the case of America attempting to try people in their corrupted, unjust criminal courts for actions undertaken while not in their country, uh, it's called exorbitant jurisdiction or extraterritorial jurisdiction. It should be an, uh, an easy reason to throw the case out. Uh, the disparity in sentences uh, to be extradited has to be what's called dual criminality. It has to be an equally an offence in the requesting country as the requested country. But they do not take into consideration that it's not an equal crime if in this country, for example, for the, the, the offences I was accused of, one might receive custodial sentence of 36 months, whereas in the requesting country one might expect to spend the rest of their life in a concrete box. This is not equivalent in any way. That argument could not be argued. It could not be argued, as was mentioned, that this is clearly a political offence. Um, there's, a, there's a good punk song from the 90s uh, by uh, Skunk and Nancy that says, uh, I won't use the swear word, but yes, it's freaking political, everything's political. Um, there is not an act of truth-telling that isn't political, especially when that truth-telling is about the ways in which politics uh, has perpetrated horrific abuses and um, the, the so-called measures that are supposed to hold them in check, the cherished fourth estate has not just failed um, to provide that necessary check and balance to power, but has become complicit in its exercise, um, again, as we've heard so eloquently. Um, so, in the absence of any of these quite reasonable arguments, uh, it had to come down to 
uh, the question of an uh, incredibly relevant and important question of whether someone might survive uh, incarceration in that system, uh, survive even the process before they are sentenced under colour of law, um, which, is, which involves sitting in the jails, going through protracted um, trials um, designed to, to wear you down and to destroy you. And in my case, um, the place that I would be expected to go and the place where Julian would be expected to go if he were to be uh, extradited um, is a horrific institution in New York called the Metropolitan Corrections and Detention Centre, um, where people who watch the news may know that someone recently uh, did commit suicide, um, the infamous uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Um, was suddenly killed in that institution, despite in my extradition there being great pains taken to suggest that this is a safe place to put someone that, 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 uh, that if you are suicidal, quite understandably, because you've been taken away from your country and your family uh, to a place you've never been, to be um, torn down and tortured by strangers uh, for trying to do the right thing that you might find yourself um, lacking any more in, in any hope, um, knowing that your life has been reduced from all its possible value, all its possible capacity to being an example to others, to scare them out of uh, at similar acts of courage, that you might then um, want to take uh, that way out and not sit through that for the rest of your life. Um, and so it was found in my case that uh, despite the, the great efforts made by the prosecutors to suggest that it's all hunky-dory and it's a uh, ring a ring of roses, not ring a ring roses, but you know, like uh, nursery rhymes and kumbaya in this, this detention system, um, that actually, you know, it, it, it is horrific that um, when somebody is deemed to be suicidal, quite um, understandably many are, um, most will actually attempt to cover this up because the so-called treatment to make you safe is to put you on suicide watch and suicide watch is unfortunately just a euphemism for another kind of solitary confinement uh, where you are taken away uh, from society taken away from any group activities and you are kept in a, another small cell uh, not allowed outside and watched night and day until you find this so torturous that you will um, you will make out that you're feeling much better and Go back into the uh, the general um, uh, general company of the prison, and it is at that point that people sadly affect uh, their suicides, and they do so in numbers that would would make you sigh if you were to have had to look into it as I have had to. And so, so in my case, um, I lost in the first instance at Westminster Magistrates Court, um, as was to be expected, because until um, until the case of Gary McKinnon, another person who was accused of um, uh, hacking, not out of any criminal or malicious intent, but to, to seek after truth. Um, before his case, which had to be stopped by a political intervention uh, by Theresa May, and perhaps the one good thing that she did in her career, but opinions may differ, um, there, there had been an expectation that the United States would win. It was just the default presumption. Uh, after Gary McKinnon's case, they they took away the discretion of the Home Secretary to consider the human rights implications. And I have to spell this out, and I'm sorry, it won't be much longer. I have to spell this out because it's because of how Kafkaesque it is. So whereas before, um, it, it is and remains um, both a judicial and a political decision to uh, render up a, um, a citizen or a subject um, of one uh, nation state of one sovereign territory to another, um, uh, judicial because it requires an assessment, or should require an assessment of facts and evidence, and political because it's necessarily a transaction between states. And so the final check was that the Home Secretary would 
be obliged to make that final, to underwrite that, that final decision to put their signature or their stamp on it. And they would be required under uh, human rights law in this country, stemming uh, from the, the, the European Declaration of Human Rights and the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and stemming from um, case law um, that says that all decisions of the executive uh, must act in accordance with human rights. They had to consider uh, whether that somebody's right to life um, and, and dignity and other human rights would be infringed by this extradition. And the, the government took away this requirement. And so I, we, had, we had to write a letter to the Home Secretary. And we received a reply saying, well, I'm you know, very much aware of the circumstances. And um, unfortunately, I'm, my, my hands are tied. And I can, cannot consider whether the likelihood of you dying as a result of me signing this paper uh, is a reason not to do so. So that's, that just baffles me that this is somehow um, considered to be uh, um, uh, in in line with our even our unwritten constitution, um, but we lost. Then it went to an appeal, and um, and the only reason we really managed to get it to an appeal, um, I should say, is because I was supported um, and I owe great debt to um, uh, not just many people such as yourselves. I mean, many of you said it's the same people I recognise and I'm thankful to see again, um, but also because an organisation that that was set up by Julian and WikiLeaks uh, in the wake of Edward Snowden's um, plight and his flight uh, and, and being rendered stateless in, in Moscow um, after they tried to, well, they successfully uh, took down a plane of a president of a, another sovereign country in Latin America to try and get him. Um, a, a fund was, was raised for him and uh, an organization called the Courage Foundation was created to, to stand up for um, whistleblowers and um, uh, people involved in, in truth telling um, and it was through their support that we, we managed to organize a campaign uh, similar to the, the campaign that I'm seeing in front of me um, whereby it was brought to impress upon the courts um, that it this is not just a, a matter that they can uh, rule with unscrupulously and expect to get away with because people are watching and people care um, and people stand up uh, for what is right and and demand, not not through violence, um, but not passively either, but forcibly through their voices and their, their physical presence um, and their ability to, to speak as people here are speaking about what is right and to, you know, to, to make others listen, to, to have them see. Um, and so after a, a another few more years of harrowing process uh, before uh, a judge, a panel of judges on the Court of Appeals, uh, Mr. Justice Usley, a cantankerous old gentleman who was so far in the prime of his years that he didn't care about upsetting the um, whatever special relationship politics um, might require deference to the United States. And the, the newly elected Lord Chief Justice um, of England and Wales, or Judge e. Judge Face, as I endearingly call him, um, and. I was happy to see this week that he is also on the panel um, that will be hearing the case tomorrow and Thursday. And if they let, let me into that courtroom, I will look him in the eyes and remind him subliminally um, the decision that he and Mr. Justice Easley came to, um, which was, and I will quote, that it would be unjust and oppressive, unjust and oppressive being precise um, judicial jurisprudential, quite precise legal language, be unjust and oppressive in light of our obligations uh, under human rights to send someone such as myself, um, someone, as is now argued, such as Julian, who would face such uh, dehumanizing and torturous conditions as to make it, uh, in, in light of our character, our disposition, our history of mental health or mental um, uniqueness, shall we say. That's some breaking news from the House of Commons, and uh, let's get the very latest. Who else to ask? But of course, Tamara, hi. Hi, Kay. This is a report by the Standards Committee, which looks into misconduct involving MPs, and they
Kafkaesque it is. military outrages. It's not quite as direct as Theresa May and her husband were benefiting, but it's as pernicious and egregious because it is the politicians, their political parties, who receive extraordinary sums of money from all of those involved in this deadly trade. The military and intelligence leaders who leave office to get paid in retrospective bribes with huge signing on bonuses of the very defense companies to which they have given contracts while they're supposedly serving in public office. It is the corporate executives who might at one point want to run a good company, but as soon as they realize that when they pay a bribe, they receive part of that bribe in what we call the feedback principle. Just as Sir Richard Evans, executive chair of BAE Systems at the time that they paid six billion pounds in bribes on an arms deal with Saudi Arabia, was rewarded with a six and a half million pound apartment in Mayfair in West London. Or Margaret Thatcher's son, Mark, who was paid a 12 million bribe on that same deal. These corporate executives soon are not looking for someone to sell weapons to. They're looking for someone to bribe because that's how they can make the most money. And of course, the intermediaries, not the shadowy, dodgy arms dealers of Hollywood films but the besuited multi-billionaire arms dealers who live in the most expensive parts of London. The bankers, the lawyers, the auditors, and the consultants, all of whom become incredibly wealthy on the back of this trade in death. And of course, all of this is protected by a veil of national security imposed secrecy. The very veil which people like Laurie and Julian and others have been courageous enough to try and pull aside so that we, the citizens of the countries doing these things, can see what our leaders are doing in our name and with our money. But let us also never forget that power and its compliant media will never give up anything willingly that the only way power concedes is when enough of us, for long enough, struggle against that power to overthrow it. And you know, as we sit here tonight, wondering whether tomorrow the British justice system will do finally what is legally and morally right in Julian's case, or whether it will once again show itself to be the US's corrupt little poodle. As we sit here and imagine the foreboding that Julian must be sitting in his cell with tonight. As we sit here, 
Let us commit ourselves to the sort of struggle that hopefully tomorrow, but if not tomorrow, in another tomorrow, will finally set Julian free. And what gives me hope that this will finally happen is because I had the enormous privilege as a white, comfortable, privileged South African to play a very tiny and insignificant role in the struggle against a legalized system of racism, apartheid. And you know, at very little inconvenience to myself, at very little inconvenience to myself, I was forced to leave my country, South Africa, in the mid-1980s to avoid serving in the apartheid military. And the night before I was needing to leave the country at somewhat short notice, I drove up to a hill that overlooks Cape Town and I thought to myself, never in my life will I see my homeland again. Because that's what everybody thought. That the strength and power of the apartheid state supported by the British, American, and many European governments, seemed immovable. If someone had told me at that point that just five years later, Nelson Mandela would walk free from 27 years of prison, that four years after that, he would be the country's democratically elected president. I would have not just questioned their level of political understanding. I would have questioned their sanity because it seemed an impossible dream. But that is what happened. That is what happened in South Africa. And the reason it happened was because the vast majority of South Africans refused to stop the struggle for freedom. They made the country literally ungovernable. And with the support of ordinary people in every corner of the world, they forced the banks that had been bankrolling the apartheid state to make it much more expensive for that state to continue its legalized system of racism and oppression. It was done by ordinary people, people like you and I. And South Africa's democracy has not been without massive challenges. After over 360 years of racist oppression, that's hardly surprising. One of those challenges is the way in which military corruption elided from the militarized apartheid state into our young democracy. Just four years after our democracy, the country decided to spend $10 billion on weapons. Weapons that we didn't need, weapons that we have barely used. This was at the time that our president, Thabo Mbeki, told the six million South Africans living with HIV or AIDS that we couldn't afford to provide them with the antiretrovirals they required to stay alive. Over the next five years, because of that policy choice, 365,000 South Africans died avoidable deaths. 32,000 babies a year were born HIV positive because we couldn't afford mother-to-child transmission treatment. 
but we could afford to spend $10 billion on weapons because conservatively, the defense companies led by BAE Systems, championed by Tony Blair, paid $350 million in bribes. But you know what? In South Africa's young democracy, where our investigative media puts a country that is supposedly home to the world's oldest parliament to shame, on the 11th of April next year, I, along with over 200 other people, will give evidence against former President Jacob Zuma and the French arms company Thales, who bribed him for that corruption. But today, I live in a country where Tony Blair, one of the most corrupt war criminals on this planet, not just walks free, But every time he opens his mouth, every mainstream newspaper in this country, especially The Guardian, fawn over his every word. While an actual truth teller is tonight in jail So let us remind ourselves that to change our political system, to change the nature of the world that we live in, that benefits not even 1% of the population of this planet. It is up to us and no one else. And so let us say together tonight, and let us say together tomorrow morning, and let us say until Julian is free, justice for Julian. I'd now like to um, just remind everybody that it is your taxpayer money that is funding the CPS as Claire Dobbin and James Lewis QC, Claire Dobbin QC and James Lewis QC. And the CPS under Keir Starmer's leadership um, was involved in stitching up Assange. Let's make sure that we hold them to account for the things they say in court tomorrow and elsewhere. Let's remind ourselves that the real criminals are George Bush, Tony Blair, and their numerous allies across the world, including in Sweden, which wanted to prolong the Afghan war so that they could sell more Gripen fighter jets. In Ecuador, where they denied a citizen of asylum without due process. In Australia, where they continue to stay silent on the torture and prosecution of one of their citizens. And in Britain, which facilitates US imperialism. Um, I'd like to remind us though, on this, you know, against all of this, the wonderful shining example that WikiLeaks brings of security for the documentation as well as security for the whistleblower, connections with small organizations, for example, in Tunisia and Lebanon and elsewhere in the world, whether in Kenya exposing um, corruption or sparking a, uh, uh, the Arab Spring in uh, parts of the world, or indeed in global 
globally relevant articles. So allowing whistleblowers to talk to those who understand their local information, but also those who understand um, the international information or who are interested in it. Allowing us to have a secure Dropbox facility that is now emulated by many national newspapers and I believe over 29 different free speech organizations and uh, whistleblowing support organizations. And of course, all the changes to the global media that have taken place, which has put the global media into the pockets of the oligopolists and WikiLeaks broke through that and revolutionized journalism by allowing both archival and accuracy. And it still continues to have a 100% accuracy record. These are the things we remember Julian for, not, not what they smear him with. And um, one of the important things about these Free the Truth events is that um, we have these brilliant speakers, and uh, I'm very grateful to them for their time. But this is also about us in the audience talking to them and asking them questions and inspiring them to do other things and inspiring ourselves to go on and set up new things and different things. So um, before I throw the floor open for questions, and we will take as many questions as we can. I know some of our speakers will leave in a bit, but um, we will try and answer all questions. Could I just ask, um, Emmy wants to pass on some information about uh, various actions. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful panel discussion, Deepa. We're very grateful and proud to support your, your actions. And thanks to our lovely guests today, all of them, and particularly Larry for his courage, because he has suffered through all of this. Um, all of us will be at the court, I expect, tomorrow. So very, very grateful for everyone turning up. Uh, one of the things we can do as uh, people, members of the public, is sign petitions. And as I was uh, on the 11th of August inside the court, uh, I looked at the judges and uh, I found they are human like you and I. And I thought, looked around for representatives uh, of the public and there was none. There was no jury in these proceedings. This is a point that is extremely important and one that we have to revisit in the future for extradition cases. I have here a petition I'd like to quickly read and I would... Um, Please ask you to put your names uh, at the exit on that piece of paper. I'll read it quickly. To the judges presiding over U.S. versus Julian Assange, you have in front of you the case U.S. versus Julian Assange, the publisher of media organization WikiLeaks. The way this case has reached you, you are asked to deliberate on narrow aspects of the law without looking at the broader picture of the consequences of your decision. You're obliged to look at the law and the evidence impartially and deliberate fulfilling your duty to society and the public. In fact, you, the decisions you are making, you're not making in your name, but on behalf of society, since it, since it is our society that has institutionalized the function of your role. Your decisions are a legal expression of the culture we share as it evolves through the centuries of our nation's existence. As members of this society, as members of the public, we hold no role and function in the proceedings before you, since there is no jury established and institutionalized in court proceedings today. We have no role or function as members of society today, other than sit in the public gallery and come outside the court, raising our voices to be heard loud and clear, expressing our view, that the prosecution of Julian Assange is not in the public interest and he should be freed by this court. Yet, we are part of the fabric that supports your function. We fund the building and upkeep of such fine buildings. Our tax sustains you and your families. We support the good functioning of the royal courts by keeping our side of the social contract to adhere to its decisions collectively. In that capacity, which besieges you, do not put upon us collectively the responsibility for Julian Assange's intellectual and physical demise. We do not want his blood on our hands as a society. Through his publishing work with WikiLeaks, 
Julian Assange propagates society's progress through learning and increased understanding of a human condition, how the world works, how our public life really functions, fundamentally supporting the pillars of our democratic system. His work gives the opportunity for enlightenment, desperately needed for people in our society. His work shines a light where we fail. As a society, we fail as a society, and these failures have dramatic consequences on people's lives abroad and at home. This is why the prosecution of Julian Assange is not in the public interest. Your decision on the case before you will determine what direction our society takes for the future. Choose enlightenment and not darkness. Generations before us have given their intellectual input, hard work, sweat, and often even their lives to reach the state we live now without the fear of arbitrary violence unleashed upon us as a society on a massive scale. Yet, following the case of Julian Assange, the threat of losing this is evident. Our intelligence services, our police, our governments stood silent or were complicit as foreign actors planned the kidnap and murder of someone who lived among us. Julian Assange is one of us. His prosecution is not in the public interest. The progress of this country has achieved is priceless to all of us who live here. Let our progress continue. Do not choose our intellectual and moral decline. How can it be that our society, through our institutions, can reject the fundamental humanistic values of enlightenment that Julian Assange's work with WikiLeaks represents? Public opinion agrees. The prosecution of Julian Assange is not in the public interest. No jury would send him to America to face his tormentors. In times when our society is tested, we find out who we truly are, how far we have reached as a society morally. This is such a moment. Do us proud. Our society looks to you. The whole world looks to us collectively. Do us proud and let us cheer at your decision. Don't make us hang our heads in shame of what we have become. The prosecution of Julian Assange is not in the public interest. Release him. Please sign the petition at the exit. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to invite questions from the audience. Because we're not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about whether the roving mic will work with everybody. Um, could I ask people to either come forward or say their question from their space if they would prefer to, and then we can... Oh, there is a roving mic. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, but could I ask you to prioritize your questions to Chris Williamson? Okay. May I ask you to prioritize your questions for Chris Williamson? Because Chris has a train right away. So, uh, Calvin? Just bear with us one second. At the moment, uh, this country is being led by the most corrupt, cronyism-led government of my lifetime. The judicial system in this country is a joke. The charges that uh, Julian Assange face are far farcical. They are an absolute joke. How he has been held captive in Belmarsh this long is a joke. As most of you know here, I'm a whistleblower. Um, the question to Chris, if you had the, if you had the uh, say so today, would you defund FTAC? Would you revitalize the judicial system that this this country has 
because what I see is an absolute joke. And one other thing, I've also uh, been held captive. I was held for 18 days. They tried to lock me up for the rest of my life with charges of alleged threats to kill Boris Johnson. And FTAC claim I had ideas of grandeur because they claim that I was not a whistleblower. So on that basis, I say that the judicial system is an absolute joke. Would you change that? Hi. Uh, oh, hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> right. um, this is a, a question for Chris. Um, some months ago, two or three months ago, 2024, 20, a letter was taken, signed by 24 signatories from the British Parliament, cross party. Four people. Sorry, is there a problem? Oh, I need to. I need to speak. This is only for the camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and this letter was taken to Belmarsh. Many of us here in the room were there and saw that letter being presented, or the initially looked as though the governor of Belmar Belmarsh was not going to accept the letter from our elected MPs. My question is, given your knowledge of how Parliament works, um, what happens to such an initiative? It seems to have disappeared. Uh, it was a request to have a video meeting with, um, with Julian Assange. And I would have thought that the people who, who signed that would now be putting pressure to it for that to actually happen, but it seems to have disappeared. So how does the government, how does the parliamentary mechanism work in that respect? How do they keep pushing? for something that they want to have happen like that. My question is to Chris. My question is to Chris Williams that um, sorry, my question is to Chris Williams. OK, we all know is um, is the, the issue is exposing uh, what Julian has done. But is it also the fact that ex the exposure was to do with Iraqis? And had it been some other country or other nationals, the overall, the judiciary, the politician, the, um, the view or the attitude would have been different, more sympathetic. That with Iraqis, a million Iraqis or whoever were killed, so. What are we in? What are we talking about? It's just Iraqis, isn't it? I mean, I think, well, apologies, I've got to leave to get a train, uh, so I've got to get down to the station for uh, two minutes past at nine. I mean, I think just in general, to respond to all of those questions, I mean, our system isn't working. Parliament doesn't work. Our representative democracy is broken. The problem we've got is that our representatives on both sides of the chamber are not representing us. They're representing the 1%. And until we break this political duopoly, then it will remain that way. So I think my call to all of you today and everybody who's watching is that we have to band together in order to demand a different type of system. We need to break our representative democracy and replace it with something better. We need to replace it, in my opinion, with a participatory model of democracy. And yes, our judiciary is not working. Uh, the system that the comrade mentioned uh, at the beginning is, isn't working. Uh, it's actually penalizing people, treating people appallingly. Parliament's not working, but can keep the pressure up. Keep pressuring, that's all we can do. But in the meantime, until such time as we do find a way of finding common cause with each other, then this system's gonna continue. And let's remember the British Empire was the most successful empire in the world and their past masters, the establishment, at divide and rule. And we have to break through that. Instead of falling out with each other, and people on the left and people on progressive politics are very good at that, finding things that we disagree with each other about, let's actually 
focus on the real enemy. And the real enemy, of course, are the elites in society. It's corporate capitalism, it's neoliberalism, it's imperialism. And we have, Joe Cox made this point, there's more that uh, unites us than divides us. Keep that in mind. Keep that in the forefront of everything that we do. And as I say, rather than finding those areas that we disagree with each other about, and there will be areas, there will be nuances, of course there will. But let's remember that we need to keep our eyes on the prize. And the eyes on the prize is building a decent society, a better society, a good society. And of course it's possible to do. We are the fifth biggest economy in the world. There's no need for anybody to be living in poverty. And there's certainly no justification for the imperialist wars that we've been engaged in. Support the work of Andrew here, for example, who's doing some brilliant work on exposing the arms trade. It's crucially important that we do from here, all of us, because all of us in this room are opinion formers. Let's go out and raise political consciousness because I'm absolutely convinced that when people are armed with the information, they will not tolerate this totally broken and unjust system. Solidarity, comrades. Apologies, I've got to leave. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. May I invite some more questions for the from the audience? And you're now welcome to ask questions of any of the speakers. Um, so, any questions? Yes, please. And could I just request that we will have to close up in about 10, 10 or 15 minutes. So, if we can keep questions short, we might get more in. Thank you. Uh, and if you could just project, because that mic is only for the streaming, so it doesn't, okay. we can't so A you. question, I think, for, for Andrew is, um, I, I'm particularly unhappy with the way these court proceedings against Julian Assange have proceeded. And I, I think, really, there needs to be a way that we hold these judges to account. Yes. Because what's, what's, what's happened... Yes, yes, yes. What's happening? We've, we've, we've had this superseding indictment introduced halfway through the case. So it's completely unacceptable. Should be thrown out. And we've got we've got a, we've got another hearing um, going on where we know the key witness has lied. It's just that this is farcical. And I think the need these judges need to know that there are going to be repercussions. If they go on with this, they are committing a crime. They, yeah. they are actually criminal. Yeah. Yeah? And it's just like, they're, they're not. Judges are supposed to implement justice. And then well, they're frauds. This is fraudulent. You know, How could we best hold these people to account? And so, in, in a positive way, so that people don't follow their example in the future, so we don't have judges doing this kind of thing in, in future cases. So that's, that's my question. Thank you very much. Well said, comrade. We'll come back to Andrew for that question. Could I take a couple more? Yes, Eric, please. Eric, uh, of course, has been seen outside Belmarsh Prison and elsewhere, and it's wonderful to have someone who's uh, leading the way uh, irrespective of the weather and irrespective of uh, how things are. Thank you very much. Yes, as well as I can. Uh, okay. Uh, as we know, the Crown Court uh, Judge uh, Vanessa Baratzer said Julian should not be extradited. And of course, she gave a reason, which I think none of us would like, although we were glad when she said should not be arrested. But she said because he would be able to circumvent, which means to get around any suicide prevention measures of the United States. I think one can question that. It seems to me they, they watch you every minute of the day. But anyway, she said that. But then she said something else, which I didn't know until now that Julian had to remain in jail until the appeal of the appeal of the United States, as we know, in September. We're in October now, careful, in September. So the United States said, yes, they wanted to have him extradited, you see, but 
there was a decision unofficially. Officially, they said, we will decide in October, which is now, okay? Now, we can't predict what they might say tomorrow and the day after. But having already reserved what is, I think, a dubious right to say we will decide in October, what is to prevent them tomorrow, the day after, because the 28th, it's two days, okay? What is to prevent them from saying, again, we will not give our answer as to whether or not she makes it out or not. We'll do that in December. And then in December, they can say the same thing. We'll do that in Easter. Easter the same. It goes endlessly. Over a year ago, a medical team examined Julian Assange and said he was in urgent care of medical tra treatment in a proper teaching hospital. They said this, okay? There was a prognosis. We're talking about science, you see. We're not talking about speculation, okay? So the, we have to say that if the decision is, we hope it isn't, of course, but if it is that we won't give our answer now, we'll give our answer in December, not only does this go against a demand you've heard us utter many times, there's only one decision, no extradition. We didn't say there's a second uh, um, possibility, a second that they would not Could give an answer. We didn't say that. Perhaps the law allows us, I don't know. I mean, you know, Thank it's you. so obscure. You know? Thank you. But anyway, as far as we know, when they made that promise, yeah, they would they, they'd give their word. You, they would tell us in October, then they should tell us. They can't say they're going to tell you in uh, December, December, January, and all that. Okay, so this is important. We should say that, and we should insist we on it. The, they have not mind, kept their word, um, unless they give yeah. an answer to that. Thank you. Um, in terms of, of responding to the issue of holding judges to account, you know, in, in any struggle, you have to do things in parallel. The reality is the way we look at the global arms trade is that the only thing that is going to bring real profound change to the nature of the arms trade and the militarism that informs it is profound political and economic change in the way we're governed, in the way our economies are structured. And I'm not convinced that that's going to happen in my lifetime. But that doesn't mean that one shouldn't struggle towards it. At the same time and in parallel, one has to deal with the situation as one finds it in the here and now. So in dealing with the global arms trade, one can't ignore what is happening in Yemen today and trying to mobilize specifically around trying to stop the murder of innocent civilians by our government. And it's a similar issue when it comes to the judiciary and to what we are seeing in the case of Julian. So the first very important thing to bear in mind is that there are many things we can do in the here and now. There have been complaints that have been lodged. So misconduct in public office complaints have been lodged in relation to Judges Taylor, Snow, and Arbathnot. Those have been made. They are on the JADC website. They need to be supported. So every one of us needs to look at that website and needs to ensure that as many other people as possible see those complaints and support them. Then we've got to look at the antiquated system of justice in this country. In South Africa, which as I said, is by no means a perfect democracy, 27 years into its democracy, at least there is a public process in which public representatives ask questions of potential judges. 
and the judges have to respond, and every South African has access to those hearings on television and or radio, which in rural areas is, is used far more than television. Now, I'm not saying the South African judicial system or the South African judiciary is perfect, but when I look at the way in which South Africa's constitutional court, with a very progressive constitution, let's say, has held the state to account, regardless of who constitutes that state, I actually think the United Kingdom could learn a great deal from it. So I think there are processes that could be brought to bear that would make the appointment of judges a more open, a more public, a more participatory process. But then, of course, the laws that judges are supposed to rule on are themselves very problematic. And we've heard how there are adjustments made to laws because of political developments, because of military developments like the so-called war on terror, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that comes back to what Chris was raising about the nature of our representative democracy. And I think, you know, there are many political analysts and thinkers around the world today who would say that the form of liberal democracy that is currently practiced in those countries where we live in liberal democracies is failing the vast majority of people in those countries. And I think we experience that in the reality that this, the sixth or seventh richest country in the world, has more food bank use than at any time since the Second World War. Now, you know, the reality is our system of government and economics is failing, if that's the case, at a very basic test. So clearly those who are being elected in our democracy, which, like the United States of America, is the best democracy money can buy, and let's not forget that. Those are the words of Greg Pallas, the American journalist. I mean, I am represented by Sir Keir Starmer. Now, you know, the reality is that as a constituency MP, before he became leader of the opposition, he was appalling. He has no politics. He has no principles. He has no ethics. He's a charisma-free zone, and he is remarkably divisive within his own party, within his own constituency. And we, we, when we tried to tell the broader Labour Party that, they still went ahead and elected them the leader. And everything we knew about him has come to pass. And I do wonder whether he is the most inept and abject leader of the opposition or leader of the Labour Party it has ever seen. So. We've got to look at our political systems, but that's a big task. That is a long and a profound struggle, and we have to engage in it. But at the same time, we've got to do the things we can do now. So I would say to you, when we go home from here, let's all look at the JADC website. Let's look at that complaint and let's support it so something can start happening in the here and now. For the final comment of tonight, I, I, I realize there are a few other people who have raised their hands and we'll try and take you, but because we are live streaming this and we have the room until a certain time, I'm going to invite Lowry to make some comments. But if you, as long as the speakers are willing and if you're willing uh, and as long as they don't chuck us out, you can stay and ask a couple of questions, but we will stop the live stream once this final comment is given. <clears throat> So um, there were a lot of very good questions there. Um, uh, I, I took from them a few points, um, really, and I just, you know, add to and enrich what was just said. Um, the main issue seems to be that we are banging our heads against the wall, that um, the, the mechanisms that are, are given to us or are suggested to us to, uh, to seek redress, to seek accountability and to agitate for justice uh, do not appear to work. And that's not, you know, accidentally, it's because they are designed to give the illusion that they work, but actually they um, they fritter away the will and the energy of people that, that attempt to use them. And so the question that was asked so poignantly, what do we do next? What do we do next when the petitions are not heard, um, when the, the calls to our elected representatives for very reasonable requests um, are not met? 
And um, the answer was given by my comrade, uh, Andrew Feinstein here, um, that you, uh, you do things in parallel, um, or to, to use the phrase of um, um, the, the revolutionaries in the United States in the 60s, the, the Black Panther Party, um, you wield dual power. And how you wield dual power is when an institution is not serving your needs, then you build alongside that a parallel institution that does serve those needs. So when there are people who are not represented by their members of parliament, because the members of parliament care for the rich and the corporations, and those people gather at the food banks in their hundreds, then you go to those food banks and you help feed the hungry and you help give succor to um, the people that have no hope. And <laughs> to slightly adapt the suggestion of some of my uh, American anti-fascist anarchist comrades, you arm the homeless, not with rifles or pistols, but you arm, arm them with the ability to know and understand how these systems work and how that they can build strength through a mass movement and you form a mass movement through providing mutual aid. That is something that we have had the opportunity to do in this pandemic, in this test of our uh, collective character when people have been struggling and people still struggle, even though we are pretending that all is back to normal, that we have the ability to work within our communities to organize and to offer when one has something spare and another has a need for it, or when one has time and emotional energy and another is lonely and feeling isolated. You go out and do those things. And while you're doing those things, you have the conversation and you build institutions and organizations that work in parallel. Um, these can be political, these can be organizations, you do not have to go do things through the ballot box. Uh, most of the real political struggles that have been won in this country and around the world have not been won uh, at the debating uh, between uh, accepted candidates that get through the filtration process of the organized political parties. They've been won in the streets through mass movements. Um, we only have to look back to the, the poll tax uh, or, or any, anything that's been successfully resisted in this country and it happens when enough people get together and say no more, no more, here, here we stand, we can do no other and we will stop and obstruct this system and we will put our bodies against the gears and the, um, the levers and the machine will be made to stop. Thank you, Lowry. Um being given um, a very clear sign that we will have to leave the hall very shortly. So please may I request you all to remember the buckets because that will pay for some of our um, speakers travel and the hire of the hall. And um, thank you all for being here and thank you to those of us who, those of you who streamed online, uh, all the different activist groups and uh, news organizations that are streaming and political organizations that are streaming. Uh, we're very grateful to you for your solidarity and see you all tomorrow morning outside the courts. Thank you. Thank you. As we... Uh, there is uh, one piece of news um, currently on its way. There is an art project that is being blocked at the border. So I will invite Patrick to say a few words about that. Thank you. So, good evening. I'm Patrick from Germany, and I'm, I'm in order here to bring you the Anything to Say sculpture. Maybe you have seen this. It's a big sculpture which shows Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, and Chelsea Manning. And I can tell you, we brought the sculpture from Switzerland to London for tomorrow. And my sculpture, no, it's not my sculpture, but the sculpture is blocked at the border from the British government. My driver is with the sculpture at the border since eight o'clock in the morning and trying to come here to show us the sculpture. And at this moment, he has to unload the sculpture at the border and nobody knows what's going on. So you can see they're doing what they want. Ciao. Solidarity, thank you very much for what you're doing.